This podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's new Patreon community, the Global Coffee Think Tank. Check the show notes or head to patreon.com forward slash Mapper Forward to find out how you can become a member today. Welcome back to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and we have Carlos Arcilla with us again, and we are discussing the Colombian coffee supply chain, particularly over the last couple of years, which have been very challenging for everybody. But Colombia being the third largest coffee producer, those Mm. challenges get quite compacted and there have been a lot of issues that have uh, contributed to those challenges. But in challenging times, we see opportunities. And in opportunities, we see innovation. And so, Carlos, in this episode, in this series, I'd love for you to talk about the innovations that have come over the past couple of years uh, from Colombia. And I know in particular, you you guys, Coffee Net, have been involved in being front runners in innovation in coffee uh, for some hot things that were talked about in the in the coffee media. But what what's the innovation that's come out of Colombia in the last couple of years? Uh, it's a really broad question, but uh, let's try to uh, put it in places and talk one one thing at a time. So Colombians in general are very creative people and, and they're always happy and they're always thinking outside the box, I think. For many years, we were uh, only allowed to process washed coffees and that changed roughly in 2015. Since that change, it's been like opening a Pandora box. I think a lot of us really wanted to be different and we were not allowed to be different before uh, for certain reasons because, and they were true, uh, producing washed coffees in Colombia is a lot simpler because of the weather and it's easier. Uh, but Why weren't you allowed to produce naturals? Because uh, there, there is an entity, as we talked before, and they had an idea of what Colombian coffee should be. And, and look, it, it, you understand why once you start processing coffees, because Processing washed coffees in highly humid places is probably the, the, the most ideal thing. It's the easiest way uh, to avoid problems like phenolic cups or right. over fermented coffee, <clears throat> not being able to dry them properly. So you do understand that it's a lot easier in, in challenging conditions like Colombia. We're in the tropic and we get a lot of rain. Mm-hmm. Not to say that you cannot process great naturals, but they do require a much level of expertise and be, you know, you've got to be more prepared. You've got to have backup plans. So it is more challenging, but it's also possible to create amazing coffees. Mm -hmm. So at this time, the Pandora box was opened. And then, like I said, Colombians are very creative people. And then we started seeing this craziness of different experiments, different uh, trying to learn a lot from other countries that we love coffees from Costa Rica, Panama, Ethiopia. And then it started and and we started seeing very different and unique processing methods. Uh, We've always been trying to be part of it, not to follow what's happening, but to try to lead by not by saying that we are the best at what we do, but we always try to be different. And since then, we started processing naturals in 2016. Only by a year and a half, we became really good at it. When, When I mean very good at it is being able to replicate practices and being able to share them again with people after that. And then that opened the next box and the next box and the next box. And it got us to 2020 where we were creating really cool coffees. We had some different things like ice naturals where we were freezing cherries cherries for three days and then allowing them to come back into room temperature and finishing up the fermentation process. We were doing crazy stuff. But I guess it's always been a part of what we do. Uh, Every month we get together with the team and we put these ideas on how to be different. And then we have a team that puts them into practice. And then we basically look into it and see how crazy the coffees were, whether they're replicable or not in time. And then we start doing it. And by this, we probably lead to 2020 when COVID happened. And like you said, initially, uh, challenging times always bring opportunities. Mm -hmm. So... In our farms, we not only produce coffees in the farms owned by my dad, we also produce oranges, mandarin, a lot of different crops, because that's what most of the farmers did in Colombia to diversify the risk due to the low prices of coffees in the last few years. And then when COVID happened, it was really hard to sell our own produce, uh, produce like mandarins and, and oranges around the country. Where I come from is Armenia, it's a small city in the center of the country. And we are very small in population, like almost uh, around 300,000 people, but we produce a lot of fruits. Mm -hmm. And all these fruits usually get 
sold to major cities or, or they get exported. But when COVID happened, it was really challenging to export or get access to these markets because the, the movement around the country was really restricted and, and really difficult for uh, like almost seven months. Colombia went through one of the longest lockdowns in, in the world. And that meant that we had a lot of extra produce at our farms that we couldn't sell. We were barely just being paid enough to cover the cost of picking the fruits. And then we were wow. literally putting them again in piles in the ground, combining them with soil, creating compost, and then throwing it back into the plants. Mm -hmm. And at that time, <clears throat> we always had the ideas of playing with different fruits and trying to see what we could achieve from them into the cup of coffee. So I said to my brother, when we had like 50 tons of uh, mandarin that we needed to throw down into the dirt, uh, let's play with the mandarin and the oranges and see what we can achieve. And it was really interesting. This is where it all started uh, out of a very difficult situation. We started playing with the extra produce we had at our farms. And then almost by six months, <clears throat> we came into a very cool, uh, I would say, um, like discovery because mm -hmm. we, after doing all the crazy thing that you can think of, we decided to dehydrate some fruit and put it inside the grain pro bag. And we finally started getting some of the flavors that we're trying to achieve. And that led us into the next step until the next step. And then these days, <clears throat> we probably at the end of 2020 produced the first amazing lot. And that was a, an amazing experience for me. The first time my brother sent me the first Castillo natural mandarin that we produced in our farm. It was a completely amazing time for us. I remember being in the office with my whole team and then my brother told me that we had something really special that we produce at the farm. And we capped it with a few of our closest friends uh, that run roster is here. And it was like an amazing, an amazing point in time for wow. us. It was an eye-opening experience. I tried this coffee for the first time and I remember getting shivers and being really excited about what the future could bring. And then that opened again, another little Pandora box for us. And these days, We've been playing with a lot of different fruits. That means we also not only use our fruits, but we buy fruits from neighboring farms uh, that we dehydrate at the farm. And then we use it with different uh, yeasts combined. And that is placed inside the grain products. And we're achieving uh, amazing coffees that I believe that a lot of people are really enjoying around the world. So yes, innovation has been a crucial part, not only of our journey, but a lot of other Colombians. I guess the other side to it as well is that Back in 2015, <clears throat> um, we saw also another big thing that is part of the innovations in Colombia is, and it's the explosion of the amount of varietals that farmers mm. are growing. And we've been also a big part of it. We run a community, a, a community uh, nursery in, in Armenia with one of our friends, and we've been behind a lot of uh, different varietals that have been spread around Colombia. So we work with really talented farmers in Wheela and in different places. Uh, one of them, for example, is Luis Anibal, who has over eight, uh, 38 or 40 different varietals at his farm. Wow. And we've been analyzing all these varietals and sharing a lot of them with um, really keen producers that are wanted to do something different, that wanted to have the challenge of producing really high-end coffees. And yes, we've been responsible of sharing a lot of seedlings to many different places around the, the country, I, I would say. As you mentioned, the different the diversity in varietals. Recently, we had uh, Madeline uh, Longoria Garcia on the podcast, and she was talking about coffee leaf rust in Hawaii and how Hawaii is one of the last country or the last coffee producing region uh, that has been exposed to Roya. So. What kind of challenges, and we didn't talk about this when we were talking about challenges, but I imagine that the variety the variety of different varietals has something to do with being resistant to coffee leaf rust, right? Not entirely, but some of them are, yes. So uh, I always said that the future of Colombia is still in my perception is pink bourbon. Pink bourbon is a natural mutation and it's fantastic. I call it, it has the three ticks because it has an amazing yield, it's resistant mm -hmm. to rust or to many diseases, and, and it produces an amazing cup profile. So some of those varietals have been targeting that side of being resistant to diseases, right. but then other ones are just really difficult to manage and to grow and to process and to, well, to get to production. But once you get good coffee uh, process out of it, they're spectacular and they're your 90 plus coffees. So I call them the babies that never grow up because <laughs> they require 
<laughs> that amount of care. <laughs> ah, well, when you have babies, you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> I will leave that to the professionals. <laughs> ah, I don't think that anyone is a professional in the heart. We all try. Look, you can laugh, but it's exactly what happens in the farms that you are growing geishas, that you're growing oh, sidra, that you are growing, particularly, for example, mocha. Mocha is a, an amazing varietal, but extremely difficult to grow and to get into production. You have mm. all these problems, the, the yield is extremely low. It's a super susceptible to different uh, diseases. So it, it is a baby that never grows up, that you always need mm. to be close to. And if you are committed to doing that, being a father forever uh, <laughs> of a small kid, then you can grow these varietals. But if you're not, then I obviously not recommend a farmer to grow these varietals because they're very challenging. And that means you need to be 24 seven on top of them. In a time when the sea market is as volatile as it is, but more on the upside than it is on the downside, are we going to see uh, producers lean more into the commercial side of things, or are they going to are they going to put the effort into producing specialty crops? Do you think? I would say that the answer is depending on how long these high prices go for. But usually what happens when there is really high prices, people, they become lazy because yeah. the difference in between uh, an 86 and an 82 is extremely small when prices are this high. But when yeah. prices are very low, then the difference in between an entry level coffee yeah. or just making it to specialty is massive in compared to an 85 and 86. So I believe it all depends on how long these high prices stay around for. I still believe that a lot of farmers that are committed to producing amazing coffees will keep doing it. But I also believe that some of them do it because they believe they have to. And that's the only way of getting, you know, ahead of the game. But as soon as the coffee, like the difference in between uh, really high specialty and just entry level is very small, then mm -hmm. there's obviously going to be a few people that are going to be just a bit lazy and say, look, if... The difference is not there and it's not enough for the time and, and effort that I spend. Why would I do it? And they just go back into the normal practices and they probably get even better return on their investment by doing that. So, yes, it may have an impact on the <clears throat> on the coffees that we get eventually, but I guess it all depends on how long these high prices stay around for. Right. And as we go into the next episode, we're, we're going to talk about the coffee industry in a more general way and and what the challenges we're going to face uh, over the next decade or so as an industry and we think about what we just spoke about what I think is going to be interesting is the fact that specialty especially the tippy tippy end of the specialty industry the margins are much smaller and if the margins are much smaller in an inflationary environment uh, that could leave a business more susceptible if they're not across what they're doing. So I think that's how we can go into the next discussion and just kind of explore how producers who are supplying the high-end specialty side of things or even the, the mid-range specialty side of things, are they on the better side of potentially a, an upcoming recession or is it better to be buying the on on the lower scale of, of things? That's a very deep question. I am happy that I have another day to think about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to go and have to change. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to speak to my pillow and then get back to you tomorrow. All right, folks, we'll see you in the next episode. Peace, love and peanut butter. Have an amazing Thank rest of your day. Thanks friends, if you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.